First, first and the most important topic of the seven topics is understand economics and make all decisions based on economics for the life cycle uh, profit impact. <clears throat> we talked then about cues, just to remind folks, and uh, the fact that cues are the major problem of economic waste, according to Reinertsen, and I do agree with him on that. And topic number three, which we were we just finished yesterday, which is the, the topic of exploiting varied variability. Um, I don't know if he uses these words in the book. It's been a while since I read the entire book, but we live in a complex world when we're talking about product design and development. And in the complex world, we do have variability. It is part and parcel of what we do. So we don't necessarily try to manage variability because variability is a given. What we are trying to do is we're trying to exploit it. That's different than manufacturing where we do try to hold any variability to a minimum. Topic number four, batch size. Topic number four is enable smaller batches. Uh, what is a batch? It is, it is how we group things together and move things through the system is probably the easiest way to talk about it. And the problem, one of the big problems of waterfall, and we have all kinds of problems with waterfall, but one of the big ones is waterfall has institutionalized, Reinertsen's word, that's why it's in quotes, large batch sizes. In fact, we are creating the largest possible batch size. And because of that, we're moving huge batches of work through the system. It's a phase gated approach. If, if we're following waterfall correctly, you're going to get all the requirements before you move all the requirements to the next phase. Being the, again, the, one of the big differences with uh, agile and waterfall is agile is moving things uh, in time, in shorter spans of time, smaller batches, et cetera. If you have a maximum batch size, you're gonna have the maximum cycle time. What is cycle time? Once we start on work, how long does it take before we get to the end point, which is making money? There is no value in the work itself. Um, if you have the largest batch size, you'll have the maximum possible cycle time. It's not completely linear relationship, but we can, <clears throat> as a rule of thumb, think about it like a linear relationship. If I cut the batch size in half, I will roughly cut the cycle time in half. That's not always true. It doesn't work on the edges because it's not completely linear, but most of the time it is. So you can use that as a general rule of thumb. If, if I'm having a problem with cycle time, all I need to do is change batch size, right? <clears throat> Um, this, these are Reinertsen's words about managing batch size, uh, fast, meaning I can make a decision if I have a batch size of 10 and I want to change the batch size to five, that's a pretty easy decision. That's a fast decision. It's an easy decision. That's a second word cheap. It doesn't cost me much to change batch sizes, at least in most cases. It's granular in the sense that I could change it to five. I could change it to six. I could change it to seven. It's leveraged in the sense that changing batch time will change the cycle time and it's reversible. If I go from a batch size of 10 and I go to five and I find out that the optimal batch size is somewhere in between, it is reversible. I can go back to 10 if 10 was better, if I wanted to. It's a very simple way to reduce cycle time. And by reducing cycle time, what are we talking about? We're talking about reducing the time it takes to actually start making money. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going back to this audacious phrase that I started this class with. I could, I believe I could double net profit of any software development company within two years if I were given complete authority, because one of the things I would, do, there's a lot of things I would do, which you're learning in this class, but one of the things I do is I reduce batch size. Because when I do that, I can start making money. What is batch size? It's, it's represented in the G-GOAT as <clears throat> a project, usually. A project is a batch. It's usually a, quite a large batch. And we're moving that big batch through various queues and stations. <clears throat> so I want to sh share with you a very simple and I think mind blowing animation about the difference on batch size and how it reflects in the ability to make money. So this is a simple process where we're gonna do things in batches of 10, five and one, starting at the top to the bottom. We're gonna move it through three different processes until we get to the end, which is finished goods. And at that point in time, we have a saleable product. Now you can imagine that 
uh, this is compounded in most organizations by the fact that there are more than three processes because even in the one uh, you know, value mapping I showed you, there were about seven different processes and we were batching at each station. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it. I will stop it at certain points because I think there's some things I wanna point out to you all. <clears throat> Here's the first one. <clears throat> the, the minimum batch size is one, right? One piece flow is what it's referred to. Um, if I have one piece flow, if you look down at the bottom, I am now, I have something, a piece of something, or I have something assuming that this is a full, fully fledged uh, feature or product or widget that I can sell. I do not have anything I can sell in the top two yet. Here's the next thing I want to point out and stop here. I want you to notice that, and this is the part that was counterintuitive. I kind of get the point and it makes sense to me that if I'm only moving one piece through that that one piece will move through sooner. But I have a whole entire payload of 10 items. What happens? In the bottom, I've delivered all of those 10 items just by changing the batch size. Interesting, isn't it? It's almost it's almost magical. It's almost like you know, most people. That's what we do. We batch things. If you, if you are going, uh, I used to do this exercise with with stuffing envelopes. If your job was stuffing envelopes, how do we stuff envelopes? Well, we lick you know we lick all the well we wouldn't lick the stamps first, but we fold all the papers first, right, in big batches, and then we move to the next thing, and then we stuff all the envelopes next, right, and then we address all the envelopes, then we lick the stamps or whatever. We don't lick stamps anymore, thankfully. We put the stamps on, right? <clears throat> we do those in large batches. We, we, we intuitively think that that's going to get us there faster or more importantly, that it doesn't make a difference. And what I'm showing you here is it makes a real big difference because now I've actually delivered all 10 of my widgets uh, versus the other conditions where I have not yet delivered anything. I'll let it play out because you will feel the same, same kind of, uh, I don't know what the word is, impatience that your uh, customers feel when they're waiting for their products to go through a large batch system. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the, the, the smaller batches are better, but there's a caveat as there's a caveat to everything. And, and I'm going to present to you that uh, I'm a big fan of the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhism. We talk about the middle path and everything is about the middle path because on the extremes, we tend to have issues. We tend to have problems. So one piece flow is an extreme. That is the, the extreme in terms of, of how small you can make batch size. Waterfall tends to be the other extreme, which is how large can I make a batch size? Like most things in life, it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know if you know the, the story of Buddha. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting story. Um, he goes, he wasn't always the best person as an individual. Um, my wife likes to point this out, that he, he left his wife and family to go pursue uh, his understanding of, of religion. He leaves everything behind, uh, including his wife and family. We wouldn't consider that a good thing these days. Um, and he meditates for a long time. He becomes a, a ascetic monk where basically he eats, you know, like one or two grains of rice each day, which is a very extreme thing to do. Right. And he's so skinny and so thin. Uh, he goes down to the stream to drink uh, and he hears people on a boat uh, talking about a, a lyre, um, stringed instrument. And the person says, if the string is too tight, it will break and no music comes out. If the string is too loose, it will not vibrate. So no music will come out. The best is in the middle. And as he's doing that, he almost drowns because he's so weak that he falls into the river and he cannot save himself. And he's saved by somebody, uh, a woman. And it's at that point, he gets that blinding flash of insight. Interesting. 
So the blinding f- flash of insight at the, for that particular part <clears throat> um, for Buddha was middle path. And <clears throat> we know that because <clears throat> even though we see the world as human beings, this is one of, we have all these very strange things that our mind does. We see the world in black and white. Really, most things are in the gray. And optimization is generally somewhere in between the extremes. So we're gonna talk about optimal batch size and how I can compute what optimal batch size is. But let's talk about the benefits of smaller batches first. Um, This is directly from Reinertsen's book. You can see the copyright there. I always say that I don't wanna get sued. I don't have that much money anyway. So somebody would be foolish to try. Uh, Benefits of small batch testing. This is uh, actually from software development as the example he uses, but it would be the same, I would assume, and other uh, things. When you have smaller batches, you have smaller changes to the system that you're that you're creating uh, at at the time. So it becomes easier to and more efficient to debug it, right? Because I, I don't I don't. If, if you're only making small changes, the whatever your you know, effects of the small changes you have, they're easier to isolate. If you make 20 different changes and then they test it and then there's a problem, you don't know which of those 20 changes, but if I only make two changes, it's one of the other, right? Makes it pretty simple to debug. There's fewer open bugs. Remember I talked about, about the fact that we wanna think about ideas like inventory. When we have defects, I don't like the word bugs, it should be defect anyway, they called it bug because in the old computers, they had the very bright cathode ray tubes or whatever they're called, and, and the, the moths would be attracted to the light, and they would get, you know, go to them, and they would burn, and eventually the, the tubes would burn out, and then they have to go debug it, literally remove the bugs. Um, anyway, um, if you have fewer open bugs, you're obviously going to have higher validity of your system and more uptime. You're not, you're not going to have problems where your system is taken down but the other thing is I have less inventory because when I find a defect, <clears throat> I need to catalog that defect. I need to track that defect. I need to put that defect into inventory and into my backlog. So the other thing that def- having fewer defects and fewer open defects allows us to do is actually I don't have uh, all these support issues that are blocking me from actually making other types of changes to the system. So there's a huge opportunity cost to having a lot of defects. This is the concept of technical debt, right? We don't, we, we were, we're reducing the technical debt. So it makes it much easier to test. And we're not doing a lot of those inventory status type activities on defects because we just don't have them, right? Um, faster cycle time, which is huge because not only does that make me make me more money, but having faster cycle time, what is that? Well, that's frequent accurate and actionable feedback, which is what we're talking about of how do we stay safe, as safe as we can in the, op- in the complex world? How do we remain optimal? Well, we have fast, action, uh, accurate and actionable feedback. So having the faster cycle time means that we're gonna have less requirements changes over time. So the cost of change is low. That's another thing that a lot of companies I work with say that the, our cost of changing things is really, really high. Why is that, right? Well, you're using, you're using waterfall. You have large batch sizes. You have infrequent feedback. You have all the problems that are attendant to you know, a great number of cues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if, if, if you were to pick the worst thing you could do for software development, you would invent something like waterfall because it is large batch size. It's infrequent feedback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it didn't work very well. Right. We can fool ourselves into believing we're optimal. In most cases, it's very hard to fool ourselves into believing we're optimal using waterfall for complex work because it's so bad. It's so apparent. Right. Um, But anyway, the faster cycle time means that uh, we get a lot of feedback. It's fast, actionable, accurate feedback. It means that there's a lower cost of change. There's faster learning. If you're if you're in knowledge work, what is the what is part and parcel of what you are selling? It is your ability to think, to have knowledge, to be accurate about the, the, the world outside, quote unquote, the objective world. Um, so all of this stuff leads to just simply better economics. So we want smaller batch sizes, but how small can we get? Usually not one piece flow. So going back to the middle path, how would we 
as mere mortals, maybe some of you are Don Reiner. Larry, I can hear you again. Yeah, Larry, I'm just confirming that we uh, lost your audio real quick. Video. Yeah, I should be back now, right? Okay. Yep, we're back. You're back now. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I got gremlins this morning. I don't know what's going on. So, something in the universe doesn't want me to talk about batch sizes. If you go back just one minute, you should be able to be good. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I think the gods uh, got angry at me. I said, none of us are probably Reinertsons. And how do we mere mortals uh, calculate what optimal batch size is? And it's really uh, mathematically, this is the, the chart. There, there are two things to consider. There, there is the transaction cost and the holding cost. And uh, you're saying, what the heck are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about, Larry. It's really easy. Uh, I'm gonna give you the, the story that Reinertson gives. So this is not my story. I'm just, uh, you know, steal from the best. Um, he says, I like to eat uh, a, a couple of eggs for breakfast every morning. So I've got really kind of two strategies if I want to go to the extreme, right? I can, I can buy and cook two eggs every day. So I wake up in the morning, I go down to the bodega at the corner, I buy two eggs, I take them home, I cook them, right? That is a low holding cost situation, right? Because there is no holding cost. I don't even need a refrigerator if that's all I need, right? for those two eggs. Let's go to the extreme. We go to Costco, we buy their small size eggs, which is enough for a family of 10 for, you know, a year or whatever. But anyways, we buy, we buy 365 days worth of eggs, you know, 730 eggs, if I did the math right. Um, then our transaction cost is low because we're only going to the store once. That's the transaction cost is me going to the store and, and buying things. Um, but my holding cost is big. Right, because I got to buy a second, third refrigerator. I got to pay for the electricity for those refrigerators, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the two extremes here. And where those two lines intersect is actually where the optimal batch size is. Now, here's the here's the interesting thing about that. You don't need to know this in in the knowledge base world. Generally speaking, what you can do in the knowledge base world is you you can kind of fool around with those two things. There's usually not a high transaction cost on certain things in the knowledge base world, by the way, because we don't have physical goods that we're moving around and having to store and warehouse and other things like that. But there is some. So the key is to try to, to you will, I always tell people it's the same with work in progress, which we'll get to next, is, is you keep shrinking it and then you'll start to feel it. But this doesn't really affect us much actually in Scrum. Because what we've done in Scrum is we, re, we, we have reduced the batch size to be equivalent to two weeks worth of work if we're doing a two week sprint, which is generally average. So your cycle time is held to two weeks. So what you're basically batching things into whatever fits into a two week period, which is how we keep the batches low in, in Scrum, right? Let me get back to this. So how do we do this? Uh, I, I started ahead. I went ahead on my slides here. We limit the batch size because we break it into a, a backlog and then we, we uh, sequence the work and we move the top of that, the smaller pieces, the smaller batch into a sprint backlog, which is just a new uh, batch. So that's the easiest way to think about it. What, what is your batch size? Well, it's two weeks. Uh, and, and if you're, you're checking things like velocity or number of stories, What's your batch size? Well, it's 10 stories plus or minus two, right? And you, you learn that in sprint planning. That's what you're doing is you're planning a batch, a smaller batch. Um, I don't hear many coaches talk about this. I'm going to talk about something else. And, and I'm sure my, my folks will remind me, um, talk about the fact that <clears throat> what we're doing in Scrum versus something like Kanban is in Scrum, we're actually holding the cycle time. Which, which is what's going to hold the stuff on the, on the left-hand side of the equation, which I'm going to show you now. Um, 
how do we do we, one of the other things we, we want to talk about is evolutionary or emergent design i talked a little bit about that during bdd and tdd if we are doing software development and we do this big upfront design where we're doing all the architecture first and we're going into detail about the architecture before we move forward that's going to create large batch sizes so we need to figure out how to do emergent design so that we can design as we go. And, and the only way I've seen that you can do this and be successful over a long period of time is, is behavior-driven and test-driven development. Only way I've seen. It doesn't mean it's the only way that can happen. It's the only way I've seen be successful, right? Let's not confuse uh, the facts that, that it's, I said it's the only way, it's not. It's the only way I've seen. There may be something out there that I've never seen. Um, or there may be something that we haven't discovered yet. Um, and we talked about this, the sprint, the sprint or the iteration backlog um, reduces the batch that's taken into the team. <clears throat> so Scrum, when you look at Scrum, I don't, I don't know if they thought about this. I think they just did started doing Scrum and said, hey, this works. I don't think they said, Let's, we're going to reduce batch size. I think they intuitively did. But that's what we're doing. When we create a sprint backlog, we're reducing the batch size. And smaller batches move through the system quicker. It's mathematical, right? Topic number five, uh, controlling whip and start rates. So work and progress in batch size, they're, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. I'll try to hopefully remove any confusion, but, but the idea of whip, which is working progress is, is to keep that low as well. We tend to have too many things going on at once. And, and I think you all know when you have too many things going on at once, it's going to take you longer to finish all of them. It's just that simple. You got to go back and forth between them. Um, my mother used to always say, the sooner you start something, the sooner you get it done. Uh, when I read Reinhardson's book, I called her up and I said, mom, sorry, you were wrong about that one. Uh, the sooner we start things is not equivalent to the sooner we'll finish things. And, and this is just kind of a, a, a simple human thing is we tend to start a lot of things. And the more things we start, the longer it's going to take to finish anything. And this is the interesting thing for me about uh, project management, which has always in some cases baffled me when, when we're doing product work, right? Software is generally product work and using project management to do product work is not necessarily a good thing. Problem is the, the two terms sound the same. So we sometimes treat them the same, but uh, when, what, what happens is uh, we, a lot of PMOs that I've worked with in the past, they have these big kickoff meetings, right? You've all done, some of you've done this before. You have this big kickoff meeting and you have balloons and clowns and all kinds of fun things. And you celebrate the beginning of the work. And every time I, I go to one of these things, I don't, I, I, I'm gen, I try not to be a rude person. Sometimes I can be, I suppose. But I say, why are we celebrating the start of something? I mean, it's fun. It's interesting. I don't mind it. You know, we might get uh, pizza and cake. But there's no value in starting something. There's only value in finishing something. We should have the big party at the end. Usually in most projects that I've been, when, when you do waterfall projects, by the time you get to the end, man, you, some of the people have rolled off the project. Some of the people, you know, might have died in the interim and, and you don't really care. You just want to dot the I's, cross the T's and get the heck out of there. There's generally not a party when you deliver. That's just my experience. I'm sure that some of yours is the same, right? We should not be celebrating starting things. And because we're incentivizing the start of things, because that makes business happy, right? It's kind of like giving kids a bunch of candy. It's gonna make them happy, right? Not gonna make them healthy. Our job is not to make the business you know, happy and, and cater to the, all their whims. Our job is to, is to build a, a strong business that survives over time. And this, that, that is optimal, not, not just to hand candy to the business, but that's what it is. It's like candy here, hey, we started it, yay. Um, Little's law, it, it, it's basically, if you can look it up, it's, it's how long we wait is the length of the queue uh, uh, divided by the departure rate. So, you know, we can calculate what happens when we keep starting more things and doing more things at once. Um, if you cut the work in progress in half, you're going to basically cut cycle time in half. So what Reinertsen recommends is don't focus on cycle time especially when you're talking to, to, to business managers, don't talk to talk, talk about work in progress. 
you know, I go back to the Steve Jobs thing is his first thing, you know, I did to be successful when I came back was cut 60% of the work. Because if you cut the work in progress, you can concentrate on the work and it goes through the system faster. I've got a, a nice video on that one too. Um, <clears throat> higher whip rates result in higher transit times and longer cycle times, which decreases feedback and decreases quality and actually uh, in incurs a high opportunity cost because you're not delivering what you could be delivering. So where does this sit on the G goat? It sits, once you have a queue into a, a team or a process or a station or whatever you want to call it, um, they're going to start pulling things off of that queue and they're going to start working them. And in most waterfall projects I've seen, they're going to be working on a little bit of everything. They'll do 10% of this. Oops, I got stuck. Let me move on. I'll start this one. And then they'll do 10% of that one until they get stuck by something else. They'll start 10% of something else. And before long, they've got almost everything that's in their backlog at some various state, but none of it finished. Right? And that just takes us much, much longer. This is a simple visualization that comes from Reinertsen's book. Um, he didn't choose the colors. I don't want to give uh, Reinertsen a bad name. I, I chose the colors. I'm not really good with graphics, as you can tell kind of burns into your retinas and uh, you'll probably remember this for some time because of that. So that maybe I got some benefit from you choosing colors that are on the puke green side of the scale. Um, I've got four projects, I've got four features, I've got four stories, I've got four things that my honey wants me to do. Let's assume that for each one of those work items, they, he just calls them projects, but it could be any kind of work item. Um, they're going to average three months to complete. If I started all of them at the same time, and I worked on them all of them at the same time, theoretically, it would take me 12 months to complete them all, right? Simple mathematics, you're, you're with me on this. Reinertsen calls this a CEO diagram because it's so easy. A CEO could understand it. I don't know why he says that. Never run into CEOs that don't give you much attention. Um, if I were merely to change the start times and reduce the work in progress by not having four parties, but only having two exciting kickoff parties, I would finish the first two projects in six months and I would finish the second two projects in six months. The end result at the end of 12 months would be exactly the same. I would deliver all four items. The difference being by cutting the work in, in half, in this case, the work in progr uh, process, progress in half, I am delivering incrementally on two things, which means that I could start making money on it. So in the second thing, I'm, incremental, uh, I'm making 12 months of incremental income, potentially, because I've actually delivered something. Um, if, if in Larry's world, we would do project one, project two, project three, project four sequentially. I would sequence them by value and effort so that I know I was doing the most important one first. And I would get 18 months of incremental income versus zero. I can go back to my original audacious statement. Doesn't seem so audacious anymore, does it? When we know these things, because we're seeing all the things that companies are doing, they think they're winning, but they're not optimal. It's easy to confuse ourselves between actually staying alive and being optimal. There's a difference between winning the marathon and finishing it. Here's the other thing. I can learn from projects one and two because I've actually completed them and I can take the, that learning and I can apply it to three and four, but more importantly, three and four may no longer be valid at the end of six months. And it may be that five and six are valid. Now I can actually start five and six. So I have optionality. Optionality, folks, is freedom. If you want to think about the opposite, uh, opposite of optionality, it's, it's basically slavery, I think, is the opposite, the, the polar opposite. You have no control over what you're doing. You have no options. People pay a lot of money for options, right? When they talk about stock options and other things, they pay a lot of money for options. Why? Because options are val valuable. Options are, are freedom. Options are what determine the difference between me being successful and not successful in some cases, because now I have optionality. I have choices. Once you lock into starting those four projects, the sunk cost fallacy will keep you doing those four projects. You know what I'm talking about because you've been there, even when you shouldn't be doing them anymore. Why? Because we had a big party at the start. 
stop having parties at the start, start having parties at the end. Work in progress, simple uh, video here or animation. Oh, we're gonna take an example from a um, <clears throat> drive-through. This particular drive-through has three different stations. I don't know why they have three, but you're gonna do things. We're gonna move cars through those three stations. Now, when I first saw this, I, I didn't understand it, which is par for the course. Sometimes I have to reflect on things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to help you uh, understand it better. The first window takes 20 seconds, the second window 30 seconds, the last one 40 seconds. We add that up, it's 90 seconds. That's the fastest you can get through. So as we know, if we want to put one car through, it's gonna go through fast, right? Because there's nothing in the way. So this is a whip of one. And you'll notice that it takes 90 seconds. <clears throat> this red car is the car that we're using to measure the speed that we go through. That's why you see the red car. That's where I got confused before. Now you notice there's two things here that we're talking about. We're talking about cycle time and throughput rate. So you'll know where we're gonna get to at the end. If I put five cars through, obviously it's gonna take longer. So what we're going to do in this simple animation is we're going to put the five cars through until the system is at capacity. And then we're going to throw the red car through and we're going to measure how long does it take the red car to get through. So the, the, right now we're, we're uh, basically filling up the system. Then you can see, I mean, you're all, you're all very intelligent people. You can see what's going to happen when we send this red car through. It's going to get, it's just like McDonald's. You go to the two drive through windows, you're going to get stuck by the cars in front of you. So our transit time or cycle time is going to be longer in this particular case when we have five things going on at once. Now my cycle time is 200 seconds, which is more than double what it was when I was sending one car through. But my throughput rate is higher throughput rate being the number of cars per cycle. So what happens when I do three cars? That's what we're gonna do next. Well, I'm not gonna do it. They're going to do it. Well, it could take a little, little bit shorter time, but we still have to uh, fill up the system. And here we are. Now notice the red car has to wait, but not as much as with five cars. So our cycle time in this case is 120 seconds and our throughput rate is higher. We're getting more th cars through over time. So as we said before, middle, we're looking for the middle path again, the optimal whip rate. In this particular case, we can show the different <clears throat> cycle times and throughput rates because it's mathematical. We can measure it. And you can see here's a chart. And you'll notice, let me go back. Can I go back to the chart? Oh, they did here. Let me, let me pause a second. You'll notice that the you can't have half a car. So mathematically, the, the, the optimal <clears throat> is somewhere in between two and three. So if I have two cars going through, I have the, the fastest cycle time, which is 90 seconds, but my throughput rate is a little bit less than if I had three cars, which has a higher cycle time and a high, uh, or, yeah, higher cycle time, and higher throughput rate. <clears throat> so the optimal will be somewhere in, in between two and three. So <clears throat> what do we want to do if we're trying to optimize this system? Well, we can ask ourselves a question. Is it more, is cycle time more important or is through, is the number of things moving through the system more important? If cycle time is more important, I'll choose two cars. Is two is my work in progress limit. Uh, if throughput rate is more important, the, the number of things moving through over time, then I would choose three cars. You with me? Pretty, a pretty simple concept. And it's just, again, it's mathematical. It's not because Larry wants it to be this way. A couple things, when we talk about work in progress in, in Agile and Scrum, um, when we talk about a sprint, one of the ways that we're, we're going to reduce work in progress, and I know this seems kind of like a strange thing to say, 
one of the ways that we reduce work in progress is that when we create that smaller batch that we call a sprint backlog, we will limit the work in progress, the upper bound of work in progress. So let's say I've got 100 items on my backlog, and then I put 10 items into my sprint backlog. The highest whip I could have is t should now be 10. If I were in waterfall, it could be 100, right? You with me? So just that process, but that's not enough. We shouldn't be taking 10 stories and then, you know, everybody working on 10 stories. We shouldn't have 10 in progress, but at least that limits it some. Second thing that, uh, that we do, being scrum masters and, and agilist is we encourage teams to work in, in what we call swarm on stories, work together on stories to get it through. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, there's there's pair programming. So that's where I have two people working on the same thing. That's gonna limit my work in progress because I got those two people concentrating on one thing. That, and, and it's a good thing. I know it sounds strange. It's counterintuitive. We have a, we have a thing now um, and I, we've mentioned it before called mob programming where the entire team works on one story at a time. And that seems counterintuitive too, because, because the bean counters are saying, why should I pay six people to do the work of one? But I saw a great quote the other day on LinkedIn. You're not paying, uh, it was about pair programming. You're not paying two people in pair programming to do the work of one. You're paying two people in pair programming to avoid the rework of seven. That's a good thing to tell them next time. I'm going to use it. I forget who said it, but yeah, that's the truth. If you have two people working on that one story, you're going to have higher quality. Not, not only that is because you're swarming on that story, you're actually probably going to get that story through the system faster because you have less work in progress. So you get a double bonus. You're not incurring technical debt, which is going to hurt you later. And you're getting the work done sooner because you're concentrating on fewer items. I know it's counterintuitive. That's the strange world. Of, uh, the complex world is strange. It's counterintuitive. We evolved in the simple world. We evolved in the complicated world. So our brain tends to default to that. And that's what intuition is. Intuition is how does our brain default? So I, I want to make this point clear. A lot of what we're talking about is counterintuitive, which is why a lot of companies don't do it. Which is why I said, if I, you know, I had a chance to talk to a CEO and I only had 30 seconds, I would say, don't trust your intuition in the complex world. That would be the, the statement. <clears throat> and I'm not alone in that, by the way. We're going to talk about Farnham Street blog later um, when we talk about some other things. In, in Farnham Street blog, uh, they did an interview with uh, the guy who did Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, uh, Daniel Kahneman. And Kahneman said the same, almost the exact same words in the podcast. It was beautiful. I loved it. I love it when people agree with me anyway, but he's, he's a smart guy. And I love it when smart people agree with me. He said, what I would tell people is don't trust your intuition in, in the complex world, which is the same thing I've been saying for years. Why? Because <clears throat> our brains are a little bit strange. They weren't built for this. We do okay. But you ever watch that AT&T commercial? You know, how's that, How's your doctor? Oh, he's okay. Okay is, is not good enough. We wanna be optimal. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, we, we swarm on stories. We get, we get multiple people to work on the same story and get it done quicker. Um, <clears throat> we take a, a product approach to projects, meaning that we don't worry about necessarily the projects, we worry about the product and we concentrate and focus on fewer things, the things that really count. Um, here's a big one. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> when we're in the knowledge base world, right, and the thing that we have, which is our quote unquote in inventory is ideas, if we don't show it in a backlog, and it's not transparent, and it's not visible, um, it causes problems. That's why we have backlogs. We're making a physical manifestation of, a, of an intellectual thing. It's this kind of the same thing with work in progress. If, if we're not really visualizing the work that we're doing, <clears throat> sometimes we end up doing too much work in progress because we're just not paying attention to it. So we create these things called visual control boards. That's what JIRA does. JIRA is basically JIRA and its ilk that they're supposed to help us with, I say supposed to, help us with Agile and Scrum um, is basically just a visual control board that shows us how much work do we have actually have in progress? How much are we actually doing now? because it's easy to lose track, trust me. 
Um, and then the second thing uh, to reduce work in progress is when you're doing planning, do capacity planning and don't plan for eight hours a day because you won't get it. You're going to get more like four or five hours a day. If you plan less, obviously, um, in your sprint backlog, you're going to have less work in progress, I would hope. <clears throat> the examples I'm using are uh, for, for not only um, batch size, but for work in progress, they're using units of the same size, right? We're assuming things are uniform. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because it helps to prove the point, right? Remember we talked about before, when, when, when you have a, a, a queue that has things of different sizes, what happens to your capacity? It shifts to the left. Well, think about the first thing we looked at a batch size. What happens if the things in your batch are of different sizes? Does that make things simpler or, more, or worse? right? It makes them worse. It's the complexity. It's not just the fact that if I have things of different sizes in a batch, I should continue to decrease the batch size, not increase it because of the, the, the effects of varying sizes. You with me? We're showing, an, we're showing almost an idealized world. Same with work in progress. If, if there's a variability in the size and we're going through a drive through and so, so somebody has a bigger order versus smaller order, that's gonna complicate things. But that doesn't argue for more work in progress. It argues for less. The variability in the complex world argues for less batch, uh, smaller batch size, less work in progress, not the other way. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Because when it, the complexity shifts, everything is shifting everything to the left. I've often, I've often wanted to. I don't get to do everything I want to as far as crazy experiments, but I've often wanted to get uh, what I would call working pods, which are almost. I, I know you're not supposed to split the Scrum team developers, but but maybe even maybe call it a smaller Scrum team, but just two developers and one QA working together, and then just concentrating on a story till it's done, and then picking up the next one. Because I think that that alone would would continue to increase my ability to do things and it would it would fix for some of the variability in sizing the only problem with that is people want to take vacations and things like that pesky people so it makes it really tough to do just three people but i think that i think one of the keys and i getting to it more and more i think it's it's mob programming is to have teams of even smaller sizes probably maybe four maybe five and having them just work on one thing at a time, finish it, then work on the next thing. I think that's really uh, optimal. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's practical if you ever get people to do it, but I keep coming back to that. Keep reducing work in progress. Keep reducing batch size. You're going to get a, a much much better product in the end because you're gonna you, you're more apt to probably build quality in, and you're going to reduce cycle time, obviously. <laughs> Oh, I did. I put in the slide. I forgot. I put in the slide. This is great because we've been talking about uh, uh, queue size, number of queues, batch size, and work in progress. These are the four things that affect cycle time, right? You're all with me. You remember we talked about queue size last time. There are two main ways that uh, organizations attack agility, quote unquote agility. They create scrum teams or they do something called Kanban or scrum bond. They are two different ways of attacking the problem. And I'm, I'm going to explain them to you. And the reason I think, I think this is worth the price of admission, just this one alone, because I don't hear any other coaches referring to it this way. The number of cues, the queue size, the batch size, the work in progress is relational to, meaning roughly equivalent to cycle time. <clears throat> Here's the way, here's what Scrum does. And this, this is the, the nugget of gold. This is the, the mental model. This is the lens I want you to look at. Scrum works on the right-hand side of that equation. Scrum holds cycle time constant. So let's say I have a two week sprint. Scrum says my cycle time is now two weeks. And in order to achieve that cycle time, what do I have to do? I have to do the things on the left. I have, to, I have to reduce the number of queues. I have to reduce the queue size. I have to reduce the batch size and I have to reduce the work in progress. That's how you're successful. This is the thing about Scrum, by the way. 
Scrum is a framework. There is no guarantee you'll be successful because you only be successful if you change your behavior. And you probably won't change your behavior until you change your ideas, which is why this course is all about ideas. But that's what Scrum does. Scrum says, I am going to hold cycle time to two weeks and I challenge you to change something in your system to reduce the number of queues, the queue size, the batch size, and the work in progress. If you do and hold the cycle time to two weeks or whatever your sprint length is, but you do not change anything on the left, it's going to be a bad time. End of story. And that's where most organizations get it wrong. It's not a panacea. Scrum will take a bright light and it will shine it on every dirty corner in your organization and it will ask you to clean it up. And if you don't, it won't work. So all the people saying Scrum doesn't work have missed the point. All you've done is challenge the organization to change its behavior. And if the organization doesn't change its behavior, it's not Scrum's fault. Kanban. Kanban is a workflow system. Kanban itself, I, I know Jim will put it in chat probably, I don't remember, it's signboard, I think is what it means in Japanese. Because what they did is they basically, had, you, they used to have them in Walmart back in the old days where they'd have a card. And when they got to the card, that was basically saying, okay, your inventory is running out, you need to replenish. And that's kind of how it worked. There's more, much more to it. So don't say, Larry, you're wrong or simplistic. I'm trying to be simplistic to make a point. Kanban works by holding one of the things on the left constant, and that is work in progress. Kanban says we are going to set what's called whip limits. We're going to hold to these whip limits. And it's a, and it's a pull system, meaning that once uh, it's a series of steps, and once something opens up on the right, then the things from the left flow to the right, et cetera, et cetera. And if things are not moving through the system, we know we have a problem. And Kanban says, let's get together and let's fix that problem because then we fix the system. This is systemic thinking, right? If you just increase your whip limit, it doesn't fix the problem because you just keep trying to move things through the system, but they're not going to move. This is where theory of constraints will come in into play as well. So we sometimes, especially for team, teams that are doing like operational concerns or things where they can't plan two weeks in advance, we will sometimes use a, a Kanban style of workflow. And the difference being is we will, you know, limit, we will look at how the work flows through the system and we will limit those columns as it goes from place to place within the system so that we can reduce cycle time. Um, because we're in the complex world, we will add some of the feedback from Scrum to these Kanban teams. So we sometimes call it scrum bond, right? And the things that we add back are usually the daily, some kind of daily standup. We usually do some kind of retrospective. You may have review or not have review. What you're really getting rid of is you're getting rid of all the refinement in advance because what you're doing is you're taking uh, whatever's at the top of the board when, when it's time to take it and you're moving it through the system. So you're doing refinement in real time. That's the big difference. So all of that pre-planning you're doing in Scrum goes away in, in Kanban and Scrum Bond. That's the difference. If you, if you get it, that's great. If you don't get it, that's fine too. It's just, I want you to understand. Scrum holds cycle time. That's what we're here for. And it challenges you to do the things on the left. Uh, Kanban will hold whip work in progress and it will, by doing so, reduce cycle time because it's an equation. The thing on the right, left is, is relational to the thing on the right. Topic number six. Just checking time. Woo, I got to speed up a little bit. We'll get through it. Topic number six. Everything we should do is should be, prior, uh, we should do our prioritization based on economics. Now, when he says prioritization, I'm going to put in the word sequence. <clears throat> because I don't like the word prioritization or priority because what I found in, in, in actual use in the quote unquote real world is that priority tends to mean what the business wants, which is only part of the equation. It's the, it's usually the value side of the equation and the value side of the equation isn't enough. 
right? I, I, I need to know more, the value side being equivalent to, you know, or, or slightly equivalent to cost of delay. I need to know more than just the cost of the delay. So I don't want to say prioritization. I want to say sequence, better word. Priorities, good word. Sequence, better word. Um, so where, is, where it says, uh, you know, question is, how do we sequence the work? <clears throat> in manufacturing, it doesn't matter. I've said that time and time again, right? First in, first out, who cares? FIFO. Um, what we need to do is we, we need to do what's called weighted shortest job first, which is those things with the highest value over the things with the least amount of effort, right? That ratio that, that we found or that we, we, we calculated by doing some relative uh, estimations in, in day two. Because the value is equivalent to the cost of delay, uh, analogous to the cost of delay, and, and the uh, effort is, equ is equivalent or slight, uh, roughly equivalent to the duration. How long does it take? And that's CD3. So what he's doing here is he's, is he's calculating CD3. This is from Reinertsen's too. Somehow I cut off the right-hand side and I never fixed it, but that's okay. I'll explain it to you. I have three things I'm going to do. <clears throat> He tends to call them projects because he's, he's not, you know, an agile guy. He just proved agile, but we call them features, stories, doesn't matter. Things from my honey-do list, doesn't matter. I got three things I want to do. Each of those three things has a variety in terms of how long does it take me to deliver it and how much value do I get when it's delivered, right? Very simple concept. The first project has a high value and a low duration. So one we should do first, it's 10 to one. And what you can't see is the right-hand thing, but you can do the math because you're smart people. The second one is the middle ground. It has a medium duration and a medium value. The third one, uh, it has a very long duration and a small value. Now, most organizations not computing cost delay or any of this, who knows what they're gonna do? Who knows what order they're gonna put it in? Because they don't worry about sequence because if they're doing waterfall sequence, it doesn't matter anyway. Right, even if they're doing agile sequence, sequence really matters now, and, and maybe they're not doing the proper sequence because, you know. Anyway, what he's doing is he's saying, okay, let's take the two extremes just so we can show what it would look like. Let's say we did things optimally. Let's see that we did things mathematically perfectly. We would do project one first, project two second, and project three third, or feature one. I'll call them features because I, I don't like project term anyway. Feature one first, feature two second, feature three third. That's the sequence with which we should do the work. <clears throat> and notice we're doing them sequentially, which we should do. We're not doing them all at the same time because this is just a thought experiment anyway. Um, while I'm doing number one, number two is waiting. That's that little red square right here, right? You get that. And while I'm doing uh, number two and one, you know, one and two, number three is waiting and that's this sliver of red. That sliver of red re represents the cost of delay. <clears throat> if I do it the worst possible way, I do number three first, number two second, and number one last. I'm, I'm, no, no, hopefully no organization does this, but there's some that are close, I think. While I'm doing the thing that I shouldn't be doing, number two and one are waiting, which is this big red block here. And then while I'm doing number two, number one is waiting, which is this red block here. And that that area representing cost of delay. The difference, if I if I count the the squares, is 160 versus seven, meaning that the difference between being optimally sequenced versus the worst possible sequence is a, there's a 96 percent reduction in, in our ability to make money. I'm going to go back to my opening statement on day one. How can how could Someone with a straight face said they could double net profit of any software development company in the world in two years with unlimited authority, because I would expect that that person would make sure that things were sequenced properly. How many organizations you work for talked about uh, optimally sequencing the work? Any? How many have considered it? How many have tried to compute it? None of them, probably. And, and then, then you ask yourself the, the very simple question, why are they still in business? You know why? Because their competition doesn't do it either. You don't have to be the fastest gazelle on the plane, but you can't be the slowest. 
I'd like to be the fastest myself, right? Because then there's always somebody slower than me. I beat this horse into the ground. How do we do this? Everything we take, make, we make sure that everything is visible. We put it on a backlog and then we ask ourselves a very simple question. What is the value that this would bring if I delivered it? And what is the effort that it would take to make this value appear? We do that for every item in the backlog so that we can properly sequence the backlog. That's the, that's the purpose of doing that story point exercise. This is what almost every organization gets wrong. They think story points is about velocity. It's not. It is a byproduct of the fact that we can use that measure to help us with a more accurate view of velocity, but it is a byproduct only. The real reason that we do it is we need to make sure that the work is in the proper sequence because if we don't sequence it properly, we are missing on being optimal. And again, I'm gonna go back to Warren Buffett. What, what makes Warren Buffett a billionaire and me, you know, 10 days away from being a hobo? The difference is he gets a 1% greater return and over time that, that that goes better. So if you can be just 1% better every week or every sprint or every you know year, does it make a difference? Yeah, it does keep striving for optimization. I've shown you a very simple way to do it because what we're going to do is we're going to find that proxy for CD3 by, by doing a very simple exercise. Are we going to be 100% accurate? No, you can't be in the complex world, but you're going to be more accurate than not trying, right? It's a difference, difference between not seeing things 100% clearly and putting on a blindfold, for God's sake. I'll take, I'll take imperfect vision over zero vision any day of the week. Um, anyway, beat that dead horse. Topic number seven, the final one. It's the final one. The final one is real simple. Um, and it's a small, I think it's the smallest section of Reinertsen's book. And it's, it's a very simple concept. It's one that we've talked about again and again and again. Um, but again, he, he didn't take this class uh, and he was just writing a book about product development flow, but it's pretty amazing. Um, frequent and accurate, accurate feedback. What did I say? Optionality is king. Having optionality is great. It is, it is the ultimate freedom. This is what I tell my, this is what I tell my son. My son's 15. He says, why should I do this? Why should I do that? I said, because it keeps your options open. Right? There's, there's another thing, uh, just to go off on a tangent, which I've, I've never done before, so, so please forgive me. But um, there's, there's this thing called last responsible moment. And I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, LRM, last responsible moment. When, you, when should you make a decision? And the answer is at the last responsible moment. And why do we do that? Because it keeps our options open. Because once we make a decision, it doesn't close all the windows, but it closes some of them. The hard part is determining when responsible happens, right? But that's, that's when we should make decisions, last responsible moment. So uh, the sequencing and doing small batch size and everything else, it's helping us to do that last responsible moment decision making, because we're not trying to make all the decisions up front. That's something that drives me nuts. Because, you know, as human beings, that's what we want to do. Because it gives us an illusion of control. Because we're, we're scared, you know. You know which word I could use. We're scared that we don't have control. And we don't. In the complex world, what control do you have? Honestly, if you're being honest with yourself, you don't have a lot. But what you do have is you have things like the scientific method. What you do have is you have the uh, ability to probe the system and look for fast, actionable, accurate feedback. That's the key. It has to be fast, has to be accurate. And for it to be really valuable, it has to be actionable. Meaning I've learned something and I'm going to do something differently. And even doing the same thing is making a choice. That's why it was people, you know, about voting. Everybody should vote, but we know that a lot of people don't vote. When you don't vote, you're making a choice. You've made your choice not to vote. That's your vote, as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyway, what we need to know is we need to have optionality. We need to know when to stop things. That's, that's another thing we're not good at as human beings. You know, 
we're always taught to hang into the bitter end. And, and sometimes that works, right? That's the sad thing is sometimes it works. Usually not the best thing. We have to know, not only do we make the decision last, uh, last responsible moment, but we also have to understand and, and continually look at what we're doing. We have to ask ourselves the question, is this going to, to benefit me going forward? Because the answer is no, stop doing it. But we don't because we've invested too much. And it's not the investment of money that is always the problem. It's really the investment of intellectual capital. We don't like to admit we've been wrong. And we will contort ourselves into all kinds of crazy places in order to not be wrong. I think we should give ourselves a break and say, hey, look, in the complex world, you're gonna be wrong a lot. And just take it as given. And then look to the feedback to tell you. And is the feedback always gonna point you in the, wrong, the right direction? Of course not. I mean, I look, at, I look at the pandemic, you look at some of the stuff that came out early because science sometimes takes a while and science is hard and science is, is messy because science is, is about hypotheses and theories. It's not about fact, mathematics is about fact. But we take the best we can as far as feedback and we do what's appropriate at the time. And, and we, we have to be able to say, hey, what we knew before was less, obviously, and we have to be able to say, hey, we weren't exactly right about that. We weren't optimal about that. I, I wanna remove right and wrong from it. This is not the optimal course anymore. Let's change it to the more optimal one. That's very tough for us because we wanna be right. And we're all dopamine addicts. Um, all of these things, right? The goal of, of uh, any, anyone in a complex organization should be to have hypotheses and test those hypotheses and help that feedback to move us in the right direction. We, we, it's not a straight line, it never will be. We, we're looking for the straight line. We hire managers who will show us the straight line, you know, that kind of stuff. We're attracted to strong leaders who have all the answers. Uh, I'll get into that when we talk about cognitive bias. Large cues, batch sizes, high work in progress means feedback is slow. All of these things we did in Waterfall, again, if I were to build a system and say, this is the, the probably the least optimal system for software development, I would have built Waterfall. And when you ask, this is an interesting thing. I think that Agile and Scrum are evolutionary in the sense that if you took a team, because I've, I've worked with places that have done this, take a team of people, a small team of people, give them some work. Don't tell them how to do it, but just tell them that we want to reduce cycle time and increase throughput and increase value and increase quality. They're going to come up with something that looks like Scrum. Almost guaranteed, because one of the places I worked at, they did that. They took a group of people, stuck them in the basement. It's always in the basement, somewhere out of the way. And said, you can do this any way you want to do it. We just want you to do these. These are the outputs we want. And what did they come up with? I went down and saw it and it looked like Scrum, right? It's evolutionary because what do we need? We need fast, accurate, actionable feedback in order to be successful. Um, feedback is critical in complex systems. Um, there's a quote from Jay Forrester. And the reason I put that in there is we're gonna hear from Jay uh, or at least somebody who worked with Jay Forrester shortly. Jay Forrester at MIT invented, I wanna say radar or sonar or one of those things. He invented quite a few things. Um, feedbacks delay, uh, delays inherent in information network make true cause and effect difficult to, to gauge. This is the problem. You all know this, right? There's a difference between correlation and causation, but we're not good at that as human beings. We often confuse correlation with causation. This was happening when this happened, so this must be the cause of this happening. This is problematic. Um, the, 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 uh, Freakonomics talks about it. If you're familiar with the, I think it's a, I think it's called Freakonomics is the book. They talk about the fact that, uh, ice cream causes crime because if you take a curve of ice, and you can do this with anything, it's kind of fun to do. You look at ice cream sales and you look at crime. They correlate very well. Why? We eat more ice cream in the summer. What else happens in the summer? We let the kids out of school. Kids get in trouble. Boys will be boys. Right, and more crime in the summer. 
I don't blame. I don't want who wants to do crime in the winter. I don't want to do anything in the winter. Right. But ice cream obviously doesn't cause the crime. So we have to be careful with with cause and effect. If you go back to a program, a writer, I can't remember who talked about this. I think it was Martin Fowler said, uh, you go back to a pro programmer in a month and you say, you know, your code causes this problem. And the first thing the programmer is going to say is it's not my code. Right, because they don't recognize it anymore. The second thing they could say, you know, you're going to you could nowadays you could point to it and say, no, look, I, you checked in this code on this date. I don't remember it. Might as well be somebody else's code. You can't, because you can't have that. That's why you want smaller size batches, smaller size things moving through the system, smaller, less work in progress, because you, you want to be able to understand whether or not what you've done is actually done what you wanted it to do. But if you've done a bunch of things in the interim, how do you know which one is, is the cause? You don't. It takes a lot of time. So our, I just, one more point on this, then, then we'll move forward. I'm looking at time. That's pretty good. Our intuition, I can't stress this enough, our intuition, the way that we think, our default setting, when we're born, when we're brought into this world, when, when, when we grow up, when we're taught, whatever, is for the simple and the complicated world. We, we, we almost intuitively create large batch sizes. We, we, we create you know, high work in progress. We, we do all the things we shouldn't do. We create silos because we think it's better. It's better in manufacturing maybe, but it's not better in knowledge work because knowledge work, complex work is counterintuitive because we were not born for it. It's something new in evolution. Complex work has only been around for, depending on who you ask, maybe a hundred years, right? Okay, uh, how do we do this? Same stuff before, right? <clears throat> Scrum itself is a, is a framework for feedback. That's all it is, nothing more. I have regular feedback that I have on a cadence and that regular feedback ensures that I'm getting hopefully good, fast, actionable, actionable, accurate feedback on a regular basis so that I can be safe in the complex world. Is it perfect? No, nothing is. Nothing ever will be in the complex world. <clears throat> communication being feedback. How do we increase communication? Right, we keep smaller teams. Everything that we've talked about is all about creating good feedback mechanisms, and the Scrum framework is big on that. BDD and TDD. Why is it important? Communication, feedback. Right, TDD is great. It's feedback. I, I I add something new to the system. I run a bunch of tests, and it tells me whether or not I've broken something. Can't get any better than that. That's fast action, actionable, and accurate feedback. Continuous integration and continuous delivery, meaning that I'm always moving things forward in my pipeline to verify that what I've done in the step before is, is right, is good, will work. These are important things. That's fast, accurate, actionable feedback. This is waterfall. The, when I show you the G go, the G go, that's waterfall. That's what waterfall looks like. That's what waterfall did to us. You won't recognize it. I mean, it's terrible graphics, but you can recognize the graphics. You understand what it means. Look at the difference between that and this. What's the big difference? Oops, wrong way. Straight line, circles. Straight line bad, circles good. Right? Say, just say that, repeat that to yourself all day long. That'd be good. That's all you need to know. Straight line bad, circles good. Reminds me of, uh, what is it, Young Frankenstein? Fire bad. Plus the retrospective and the review, I got them in boxes because I I'm, I don't know. Sometimes I'm an idiot. I need to change this. Those are circles too. Fast, accurate, actionable feedback. 